This is lecture 13. Today we'll be talking about Lewis structures. In the next lecture, we'll be talking about some exceptions to this. But what Lewis structures are is a method of drawing molecules. Um, so this idea was presented first by Gilbert Lewis, and he came up with what originally was called the Lewis electron dot structure. We've shortened that now to just the Lewis structures, the Lewis dot structures. And this is just a systematic way to predict structure and bonding. So in this, we're going to recognize bonding electrons and recognize lone pairs. And you're going to learn how to look at an atom, how to figure out from its valence electrons, how many bonds it's going to form, uh, et cetera. And later, it'll help us predict shapes and properties. So the Lewis dot structure is a useful approximation of what's going on. It's not actually going to work in every system, or at least it's not going to have its predictive powers work in every system. But the way this works is you just take your elemental symbol and you put one dot around it for each valence electron. So for example, if I have sodium, this is going to have an electron configuration equal to that of neon plus one valence electron in the 3s uh, orbital. So to draw sodium's Lewis symbol, we're just going to draw the sodium element and we're going to put a single dot uh, on it. Now, you'll notice here I put the dot on top. The dot could be on the right, on the bottom, or on the left. It really doesn't matter. Now, when it does start to matter, though, is when you have more than four electrons. So, for example, nitrogen, it has an electron configuration equal to that of helium plus two 2s electrons and three 2p electrons. So now it's got a total of five valence electrons. So with this, what we're going to do is we're going to put a dot on each side of nitrogen first, and then we can add our last dot, uh, our last dot to one of the sides. So nitrogen's Lewis dot structure or Lewis dot symbol is going to look like this. You'll notice we, if we start on the right here with our dots, we had one, two, three, four, and five. So you kind of just can go clockwise around this. And again, it doesn't really matter what side you start on. You'll notice with sodium, we started putting dots over here. With nitrogen, you can think of it as starting on the right. So we put one on the right, one on the bottom, one on the left, one on the top, and then our last one on the right again. So by doing that, we've put uh, unpaired electrons out here as well. And then with something like fluorine, so fluorine, it has seven valence electrons, two 2s electrons and five 2p electrons. And when we put its dots around it, it's going to end up looking like this. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons around there. And you'll notice we have three of them that are on similar sides. When this happens, we say these are our paired electrons. Later, we'll start calling them our lone pair electrons because these pairs of electrons are actually not going to be involved in bonding at all. And it's just going to be these lone unpaired electrons here. So before we get into bonding though, let's talk about Lewis symbols for ions. So in this case, we'll still just stick with sodium, nitrogen, and fluorine. And that, remember that with a ion, we're gonna lose electrons to become more like a noble gas. So sodium is gonna lose this single valence electron to become sodium plus. Now it has its electron configuration as neon. But in the Lewis symbol, we really wanna retain information as to what happened to this ion. So we're actually not going to fill sodium's valence shell with dots uh, we're not going to look at the n equals two shell. We're actually gonna stay in the n equals three shell and just say it's empty. So we'll draw sodium like this with no electrons around it. And of course, we'll put a plus symbol up here indicating that the, uh, the ion has charge. So this is the actual Lewis symbol for sodium or the sodium ion. For nitrogen, it's a very similar thing except here now we're gaining three electrons uh, to get a valence shell. And so now we actually have eight electrons in this n equals two shell. Um, so we're still going to represent those here. 
So we'll draw nitrogen with now all of our eight valence electrons around it. Now, of course, we're indicating a three minus. So in general, if you're drawing a Lewis symbol for a cation, it generally will have nothing, no valence electrons. And when you're drawing the Lewis symbol for an anion, it'll have a full valence shell here with the charge. So fluorine here needs to pick up one electron uh, to become F minus or to have its full N equals two shell. Um, and so it's going to have a Lewis structure that looks like this with an F in the middle with its eight electrons around it or its four lone pairs around it. And it's going to have single negative charge. So you'll notice that nitrogen and fluorine, they have the same electron configuration, right? They both have their N equals two shell filled. But of course the difference is fluorine has more protons in its nucleus, so it'll just have a minus one charge. Now the place that uh, Lewis structures really are powerful is not really in individual atoms, but in compounds and molecules. So the idea here is that we're going to be sharing our unpaired electrons with other atoms. And so covalent bonds are actually shared pairs of electrons. So one atom donates one electron, the other atom donates one electron, and then they share those two together. So in that mindset, the number of unpaired dots in the Lewis symbol indicate the typical number of covalent bonds you're going to get. So for example, hydrogen, it has a single unpaired electron, and so it is going to get to form one bond. Boron has three unpaired electrons, and so boron is actually pretty weird in that it'll form three bonds. Boron is a weird exception that we'll talk about uh, more. Carbon though, it has four unpaired electrons. So we're gonna put those on each side of it, right? One on top, one on the right, one on the bottom, one on the left. And now this can form four bonds. And so right now uh, we can think of these as all being in different directions. When we actually start getting into molecular shape, we'll tell you exactly where those electrons really are. But if we keep going across the periodic table, next we'll run into nitrogen from carbon. And nitrogen actually has five valence electrons, but it'll also only form three bonds, just like boron that only has or three valence electrons. The reason is, is because nitrogen now has two of its electrons paired. Those pairs, those paired electrons, they don't want the bond. And so it'll have three bonds, just like boron. Next comes oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons but only two of them are unpaired. So oxygen forms two bonds. And then the last thing we're gonna run into before we hit the noble gases is fluorine. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, but three of the, or it has three lone pairs of electrons. So six of its valence electrons are paired off. And so it just has one lone electron here. It can form a single bond. So with this, we can predict which atoms are bonded and how many electrons are being shared between the different atoms. So now we got to actually take that knowledge and put it together and draw Lewis symbols for actual compounds. So first, let's look at the Lewis symbol for methane, which is CH4. So CH4 is a molecular compound, which means it's going to have covalent bonds and those covalent bonds right are going to be shared electron pairs. So one way of thinking about this is if we draw carbon out in the middle here, we put its four valence electrons around it in a circle. Then we have our four uh, hydrogens around here. Each of those has one electron. And you'll notice that on each of these hydrogens, the dot is on a different side. Here, for convenience, I just have all the hydrogen dots facing carbon. And then what we think about is this top electron on carbon is then going to uh, bond with this electron from this hydrogen on top. So the, we're going to form one bond on top, one on the right, one on the bottom down here, one on the left. And so we will get something that looks like this. 
Okay, so now you'll notice I just replaced two dots with a line. Why did I do that? Well, what we're trying to indicate here is a bond. We're trying to indicate that these are sharing these electrons. And so we put this line in here for our clarity. But from now on, you should always know that a stick like this, one of these stick drawings of a bond is just equal to two electrons. So in each of these bonds, this is just two electrons uh, being shared. So this hydrogen now, we can think of as having two electrons around it from this bond. But these two electrons that are uh, interacting with hydrogen are equally or are also interacting with this carbon. It's not actually equally because carbon has a slightly higher electronegativity. But these two hydrogen or these two electrons now belong to hydrogen and they now belong to carbon. Now let's think about the Lewis symbol for a salt like magnesium fluoride. In this case, this is going to be an ionic compound. And so in this case, right, we're losing and gaining electrons to uh, get full octets or full valence shells around our atoms. So the Lewis structure for an ionic compound is going to look like this. You'll notice there are no sticks between fluorine and magnesium. And in fact, we've even taken the extra step of putting brackets around the fluorines to especially emphasize that they do not have a covalent bond with that magnesium. So we have all the charges on all these ions, we have their valence electrons drawn, um, and often you will see anions drawn with the brackets around them to indicate these electrons just belong to this element, not to the other one. All right, so Lewis symbols for molecules, uh, they can get more complicated though, right? We have the chemical formula of a molecule. We can take that to draw a molecule um, and we're gonna use this concept of a Lewis structure to do it, right? So if we have something like HCl with just a binary molecule, this is really easy. Obviously hydrogen is going to be bonded to chlorine. And you'll notice here in this Lewis dot structure, the, or the electron from hydrogen and the electron from chlorine are both kind of written smushed in together right here. Um, and so if you look at a Lewis dot structure like this, it doesn't just jump out at you immediately that hydrogen and chlorine are bonded. You can figure it out by looking at it, but we wanna make that more explicit by putting that bond. And now when we have this single bond, remember that's two dots uh, equals one line. Um, and we only do that for bonding, but we can also have the case where we're sharing multiple pairs of electrons. So for example, in O2, O2 is the state that oxygen gas is. It's you know what we breathe. And in oxygen, right, we have two uh, unpaired electrons. And so if one oxygen has two unpaired electrons, the other oxygen has two unpaired electrons, they can then share those two. Uh, each can share their unpaired electrons to form what we call a double bond. So here, you'll notice we're sharing two electrons from one oxygen, two from the other. And looking at this, you might think, wait, now if the two unpaired electrons are on the same side, aren't they paired? The answer to that is this isn't a perfect model, right? This is a useful model. It's more of a prediction tool. So it's OK to move the unpaired electrons onto the same side because uh, when, all, when these atoms are actually bonding, the electrons are actually going to rearrange. And so now we've got the unpaired electrons facing each other. And these guys are going to bond in a double bond. And we denote a double bond with just two lines here. We can also have a triple bond, which we see in N2 gas. So here each nitrogen is sharing three electrons. So you can notice the traditional Lewis dot structure here with all these dots in the middle that can uh, just look messy, right? It's just aesthetically not pleasing. So it's a lot nicer when we put these lines in here. Now we're clearly indicating bonds. And now you can look at these three lines and say each of those corresponds to two dots, two electrons. Each nitrogen gets to share them. So these nitrogens are now sharing six electrons and each of them has a lone pair of its own. So each of these actually now 
has eight electrons around it. So this nitrogen has one lone pair and three bonds. Each of those electron regions has two electrons. So that'd be four times two would be eight electrons for this nitrogen, eight electrons for that. So this idea though of single, double, and triple bonds leads us into what is called bond order. Bond order is simply the number of bonds between a pair of atoms. For today, these will just be whole numbers. So for example, a single bond will have a bond order of one, double bond will have a bond order of two, triple bond will have a bond order of three, right? We're just counting how many bonds are in between. And then next time we will uh, talk a little bit about how this can be complicated and the bond orders can actually be fractions and so forth. Um, but uh, for now, we're just gonna deal with these whole numbers. And then of course, nitrogen over here has this lone pair. And lone pairs will actually get really important when we start talking about shape. But double and triple bonds, like what we see here, are actually extremely common. And so we're gonna have to know how to deal with them. And we see them mostly in carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, and sulfur com containing compounds. These five elements really like to form single, double, and triple bonds. Um, we see these in other molecules as well, but these are the elements that really like to do it. All right, let me now give you kind of a recipe for drawing a Lewis structure. If I was to give you a formula, how would you do it? And when I say this is a recipe, I really kind of think of this as a list of things that you have to do. Um, I think mentally, once you get good at it, you'll notice you're not going in this exact order. But what, you, what you're gonna wanna do is first count the number of valence electrons present. So that's valence electrons from every element in the uh, formula. You're gonna wanna then count the total number of electrons that you need, theoretically. So for this, we're gonna say each atom needs eight electrons to form its octet, with the exception of hydrogen, which needs two. And actually, we already have seen one exception to this rule in boron, uh, but we're gonna get into exceptions in the next lecture. We're then going to find the difference between our needed electrons and the number of electrons that are present. Uh, that should always be a positive number. So we should always have more needed electrons than present. So we can also have uh, zero, uh, but in that case, we don't have any bonding going on. We're then going to take this difference and divide it by two. When we do that, that's going to tell us the number of bonds we have to make. So now we know how many bonds we need to make. Now we have to look at our formula and predict the connectivity of the atoms in that formula. So some general rules, and these rules work uh, moderately well for small molecules. Uh, first, we have to choose a central atom. This is the atom that most everything else is bonded to. And for this central atom, this is gonna be the atom usually that can form the most bonds. And in most cases, it's gonna be carbon. You see carbon in a molecular formula, carbon's always the central atom, right? And it's also usually going to be the least electronegative atom, which again is usually carbon with the exception of hydrogen. However, hydrogen can only form a single bond, so it's almost never considered the central atom. Then we're going to take the order of atoms uh, that's written in our formula and try and see if we can't get any information from that. And I'll show you an example or two of how a formula can help you in a little bit. And then often we're going to take what we've thought about so far and put our atoms together to form the most symmetric structure. Nature actually seems to really like symmetry. So if you can have something that's symmetric, it's actually more often than not the correct structure. Now that we've got all that in our heads, we're gonna start drawing bonds between our molecules. We're gonna start with our single bonds first and then draw multiple bonds after that as needed. And then we're going to use lone pairs to complete the octets around each uh, atom. We're gonna start with electronegative atoms first. So in this case, the number of lone pairs is going to be equal to the number of valence electrons present. So that's going to be this number we found in number one minus the number of bonding electrons. 
And so this bonding electrons is the number we're actually going to calculate in number three, the needed minus present. And we're going to use the octet rule, which says that atoms like to have eight electrons around them. And so if oxygen has two bonds, that means it's already got four electrons. We're going to need to add um, lone pairs to it to give it eight total electrons. So we'll add two lone pairs to it, which will give it four more electrons. Then finally, we're going to check that the number of electrons in our Lewis structure matches the number in step one. So we don't get to create new electrons out of thin air. All the elements are coming with a certain amount of electrons, and those are going to be distributed through the molecule in an appropriate way. So let me give you an example of how I would work through something like this. So let's say we want to draw the structure of N2O5. This is dinitrogen pentoxide. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to separate my elements out. So this is going to consist of nitrogen and oxygen. There's going to be two nitrogens, five oxygens. So then we'll figure out uh, what our needs are or how many electrons each of these is going to need to be happy or to have this full octet. Nitrogen, each nitrogen is going to need eight electrons and there's two of them. So we'll have two times eight for nitrogen. Oxygen is the same, it needs eight. But there's five of them, so that'll be five times eight. To do this math, we know, or we'll find that we need 56 total electrons. But we don't have 56 electrons. So we're going to have to make do with fewer through bonding. So let's figure out how many we have. All right. So in this case, nitrogen is in the fifth column on the periodic table. Of course, that's excluding the uh, transition metals. Um, but nitrogen is going to start with five valence electrons, and there's two of them, so it'll be two times five. Oxygen is starting with six valence electrons, and there's five of them, so it'll be five times six. So we're starting with 40 total valence electrons. So we have 40 electrons. Ideally, we'd have 56. So we're going to have to make up for that difference through bonding. So in bonding, we're going to take 56 minus 40, so that's how many we need, minus how many we have. We're going to divide that by two. This tells us that we're going to have 16 electrons involved in bonding. And 16 divided by two tells us we're going to have eight total bonds in our molecule. We're then going to figure out how many lone pairs we're going to have. Well, if we have 40 total electrons uh, present and 16 of them are tied up in bonding, that means 24 of them are going to be tied up in these lone pairs. So we'll have 24 divided by 2, or 12 lone pairs left. OK, now we, have, we know how many lone pairs we need. We know how many bonds we need. And we have N2O5. In this case, we're going to have to try and figure out which uh, element is going to be our central atom. Usually, it's going to be whichever one's listed first in the formula. Um, but here we have N2, so we have two of these and five oxygens. We're going to want to, or we're going to want to consider the idea that we want to make something symmetrical. Um, that'll be a more likely structure than not. So if I take all that information together, I'm going to actually put these oxygens around the nitrogens. And there's actually a way to give each nitrogen three oxygens. Now, the first thing we do is draw our single pairs between all of these so that all of these nitrogen oxygen atoms are bonded together. We'll then go through and add uh, double bonds where we think they should go. In this case, to make this molecule work, we're going to give one double bond uh, on this side between this nitrogen and oxygen, one on this side. Why didn't we put two double bonds on the same one? Well, we actually can't do that. So this nitrogen can only have eight electrons around it. And it's got one, two, three, four bonds around it. So that counts as eight. If this nitrogen had been double bonded to, say, two oxygens, then it wouldn't have enough to bond to this oxygen. It would basically break off, right? Similarly, if this nitrogen was double bonded to the central oxygen, this central oxygen would then actually have a full octet, it wouldn't be able to bond to this other nitrogen. So to make this molecule work, this is actually the only possible structure that we can have. 
then you'll notice we uh, added lone pairs around everything as well. So first we single bonded everything and then we counted how many bonds we needed. So single bonds uh, are then we, we added our, uh, some double bonds here. So let's count the total number of bonds. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We said we needed eight bonds uh, there. And let's count our number of lone pairs. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We have 12 lone pairs, which is what we saw we needed. If you wanna go further, you can uh, add those up. So we have eight plus 12 or 20 different electronic regions here, right? Or electronic regions, I'm referring to lone pairs and bonds. Each of those has two electrons in it. So 20 times two would be 40 which is the number of electrons we started with, which each of these atoms brought to the puzzle. All right, I'm gonna actually let you practice this now. I've given you four formula here. I want you to go ahead and try and draw each of these molecules. Go ahead and pause the video here. It's gonna take you a few minutes to do this. Um, so keep working through it till you have a, till you think you have a good solution. And then I'll go through the solutions for each of these molecules. All right, let's look at CHCl3. Here, carbon is the first element here. So it's more than likely going to be our central atom. We then have hydrogen, which is gonna form one bond and three chlorines. Chlorine is a halogen. If we draw its Lewis-Stat structure, uh, it's going to only have one unpaired electron. So it's going to form one bond as well. Carbon is going to form four bonds. So we should get something that looks like this carbon in the center, bonded to one hydrogen, bonded to the three chlorines. The hydrogen should have no lone pairs so that it has two electrons around it just coming from the bond. The carbon is then going to have eight electrons around it, two from each bond. So again, notice here that these electrons in the bond count for both atoms in the bond. So hydrogen gets these electrons and carbon does. This is a cooperative thing. And then our chlorines each need to have three lone pairs around them to finish that octet up. All right, let's look at PCl3 now. Uh, phosphorus is uh, going to have five valence electrons. It's right below nitrogen on the periodic table. It's going to have three unpaired electrons and two uh, paired electrons. And so it's gonna form three bonds Chlorine we just talked about is going to form one bond. So you get, should get a structure that looks like this with the center phosphorus with a lone pair on it. CH2O is actually getting a little more complicated. The reason is, is because now we're introducing a double bond. So to make this work, carbon is going to be our central atom. It's going to still be singly bonded to uh, each hydrogen. But now we need to have a double bond somewhere. And that double bond is going to be right here in oxygen or between carbon and oxygen. And then of course, oxygen is gonna need its two lone pairs to finish that off. This last one is acetic acid, CH3COOH. This one is actually the hardest here. Why is it the hardest? Well, because it has more than one central atom. Depending on how you count this, it could have as many as three central atoms here. But the way it's written actually gives us some clues. So for example, this first carbon has three hydrogens right after it. That's going to tell us that the first carbon is gonna be bonded to those three hydrogens. And then it has a carbon next. So we can just say that carbon or the next carbon is bonded to the first. Now this region right here, the COOH, is actually a very common structure that we see. And it always looks like this, carbon double bonded to one oxygen with two lone pairs. And then the carbon is singly bonded to a second oxygen with two lone pairs. And that second oxygen is bonded to hydrogen. So whenever you see something like this, this is what's called a carboxylic acid. And like I say, it's extremely common. We eat these in just about every food. It's, these appear on every protein in our body, very common. And you, whenever you see a formula that has this COOH written in it, 
you're going to know that's going to be this CO2H structure right here. And so sometimes it's also written like this CO2H. And that's always this structure right here. All right, let's uh, give you one more practice, and this will be an eye clicker practice. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure of methane thiol for me. So methane thiol is CH2S. Go ahead and pause the video and try and work that out. All right, so you might have started by trying to draw something like this, where carbon has a single bond to its hydrogens and one and single bond to sulfur. The problem for this one, though, is if you try and do a single bond between carbon and sulfur, then you have to add some extra hydrogens to make the number of electrons work out. So it's not this structure. You know there's got to be a double bond in there somewhere. So maybe you tried to double bond carbon to hydrogen. The real problem here is hydrogen doesn't form double bonds. It never forms double bonds. So if you ever draw a structure where hydrogen has a double bond, you've done something wrong. So this structure overall is incorrect. So there should be a double bond in here somewhere, and it's going to have to be between carbon and sulfur. So you should have gotten this structure right here. Carbon is singly bonded to each of the hydrogens, double bonded to the sulfur, and the sulfur has two lone pairs around it. So if we look at these options, they're all asking about how many single and double bonds carbon has. Well, it has two single bonds and one double bond, so the answer is going to be B. Okay, the best way to get good at Lewis structures is practice. And there are a lot of practice problems. Uh, you can look in the book, you can look online, um, but practice, practice, practice is the best way to get good at those. All right. Now let's talk a little bit more about these single and double bonds and how those affect molecules in terms of um, strength and length. So the ideas of bond length and bond strength are actually fairly closely related. They're, they're not synonymous um, because the bond length and bond strength both depend on which elements you have, et cetera. But both the bond length and the bond strength depend on the bond order and the size of our atoms. So let's talk about our bond length first. A higher bond order is going to equal a shorter bond. So what I mean by that is right here we have oxygen single bonded to oxygen, and over here we have oxygen double bonded to oxygen. In the double bond, you have a bond length of only 121 picometers, Whereas in the single bond, you have a slightly larger bond length of 148 picometers. Now, this might seem counterintuitive because in this double bond, we've added more stuff. So you might think that pushes uh, things apart. But what you're actually doing is adding more electron density between the nuclei. And that lets the uh, nuclei actually get closer together because the electrons in between are now slightly shielding them each other, or shielding them from each other, right? The nuclei don't want to be close to each other, but if you block them out, put a sheet in between them, they're willing to get closer. So higher bond order equals shorter bonds. Additionally, the other thing that really matters is if you have smaller atoms, you're going to have shorter bonds, right? And that's just because smaller atoms can be closer together. It's pretty straightforward. Next is bond strength. And in here, the trend is a higher bond order equals a stronger bond. So what I mean by that is if we actually measure quantitatively the strength of these bonds, the single bond here uh, only has a bond strength of 146 kilojoules per mole. But when you have a double bond, that goes up nearly to 500 kilojoules per mole. So this is almost, or this is a little more than three times stronger than a single bond. So what this means is it's going to take a lot more energy to just rip apart a double bond than a single bond. Right? This is like if you tie something down with two ropes, it's going to be a lot harder to get off than if you tie it down with a single rope. And so bond energy then is the energy needed to break one mole of covalent bonds in the gas phase. So what we're talking about here is often we'll look at only a bond between two molecules, but we're actually measuring the energy it would take to break those bonds in 
Avogadro's number of O2 molecules, et cetera. And here, smaller atoms have stronger bonds, roughly speaking. That's not a perfect trend, um, but in general, the, if you're dealing with a big atom, like chlorine uh, bonded to another chlorine, these are big diffuse things. And so the electrons bonding in between them kind of spread out. And what that does is if those bonding electrons are spread out over a larger volume, they're not doing as good of a job shielding the two nuclei. So the gen general trend is the bigger things are, um, just the, the less they kind of care about their interactions with other uh, molecules or other atoms, sorry. Okay, so based on this, let's take a little eye clicker quiz and tell me which of the following statements is true. So here we're comparing the uh, nitrogen nitrogen double bond to the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond. We want to know which one is longer and which one is stronger. Go ahead and pause the video here and try to solve that. All right, there's two things that we're trying to figure out, right? We're trying to figure out bond length and bond strength. So let's start with the bond strength. The thing you have to think about here is the higher the bond order, the higher the bond energy or strength. So a higher bond uh, order is going to be a stronger bond. Nitrogen nitrogen double bond has a bond order of two. The nitrogen nitrogen triple bond has a bond order of three. So and the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond has a higher bond order, therefore it has a higher bond energy or strength. So the NN double bond is weaker than the NN triple bond. So now we know the answer is going to be either C or D. And then the second thing we have to consider is that the higher the bond order, the shorter the bond length. The triple bond has a higher bond order than the double bond, so it is going to be shorter. But the question is phrased in terms of the NN double bond. The NN double bond is going to be longer and weaker than the N and triple bond. So the answer here is going to be C. So these trends hold up for all sorts of things. So here I have a table from your book. I think this was actually stolen from the last edition. So you should have a table like this in your book. Um, and what you'll notice is the same thing. So if we zoom in here on the nitrogen nitrogen bonds, we have the single bond, the double bond, the triple bond. Here we have their bond lengths and their bond energies. You'll notice as the bond order goes up, uh, the bond length just keeps going down. So the single bond is longer than the double bond, the double bond is longer than the triple bond. And then the bond energies do the opposite. As we go up in bond order, bond energy gets larger. So the NN double or single bond has a bond energy of about 163 kilojoules per mole, the double bond of 418 kilojoules per mole, and then the triple bond is a skyrocketing 945 kilojoules per mole. Now, so far we've been talking about things being double bonded or triple bonded to themselves, but this pattern carries over to if you're dealing with two different elements bonded to each other, such as carbon and nitrogen bonded to each other. You'll notice that as our bond order increases, bond length goes down, bond energy goes up. Same is true for the carbon oxygen bonds right below that. Uh, the same is true for the sulfur oxygen bonds down here, et cetera. Now, you aren't going to need to be able to somehow magically reproduce this table, right? I wouldn't uh, give you two elements and tell me what are the bond length between these if you have a double bond, right? You won't have enough information for that kind of question. You also wouldn't have to be able to calculate your bond energy specifically, but you do need to know the trends in these and how they change. And then in the next lecture, we'll take, we'll ratchet all these ideas of Lewis structure and bond order up a bit, show you quite a bit of complexity to these issues.